That was my job. Just <laughs> <laughs> thinking to myself, I'm like, should I take the heat or not? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about you, but it kind of feels almost forever since the last time that we've uh, studied through the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's only been just a few Sundays, but to me, for some reason, this feels like it's been forever. And I think it's probably just because of, you know, Arthur. <laughs> Uh, just uh, handling and taking care of Arthur kind of just uh, seems uh, it's been years since the last that we uh, uh, covered the Sermon on the Mount. But uh, to kind of give a little bit of a background, uh, of a review of, of where we left off, uh, we finished the section of verse uh, 13 and 14 of chapter 7, discussing and answering the question, uh, which way are you traveling? And really... Uh, the section of uh, 13 and 14 goes along with what we're going to cover tonight, with verse 15 through 20. Uh, they kind of go together, hand in hand, uh, because in this section, we're answering the question, whose directions are you following? So the answer, uh, to answer the question, which way you are traveling, you first need to know which road you are traveling, either the straight and narrow or the wide and broad. Uh, there is, however, a second consideration, and that is whose direction are you following? Countless voices are crying, go here, go there, this way, that way, the other way, another way. Do this and do that. Jesus, therefore, followed his teaching about uh, two ways with a warning about those who can lead others astray. In the section of Matthew 7, verse 15 through 20, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Again, Sister Sherry, I just want you to know that uh, Hunter and I, we did not plan this. Yeah, I know his uh, class this morning uh, covered uh, the remainder of chapter 2 in Second Peter dealing with false teachers. Well, here, Jesus discusses about false teachers, false prophets, about how we can be able to know and pick out who, uh, who, it, who a sound teacher is and who a false teacher is by their fruits. And so before we kind of dive in a little bit on about you know, the good tree, the healthy tree, and the diseased tree, and the bad tree, uh, let's focus on the two direction givers. Two direction givers. Even as there are two ways, there are two kinds of direction givers. Now the passage here in the text only refers to specifically the bad direction giver, but thereby implies that there are also good direction givers. He, Jesus, directly states that beware of false prophets. So there he just directly points out saying those are bad direction givers. But then later on he uses the analogy of a tree, a good and healthy tree. That good and healthy tree would indirectly be referring to the good direction giver. And so, we begin by looking at just what he is saying with the command of beware of false prophets. Now there are, oops, wrong way, headed backwards. Two direction givers, true prophets and false prophets. Now, true prophets are the very healthy trees that bear good fruit. Now the general word, the general meaning of the word prophet simply means one who speaks forth. That's the general meaning. Now the specific meaning would be one who speaks forth from God, being God's spokesman. In the first century, these spokesmen were, uh, would receive their messages, divine revelation, from God directly. This would be the gift of the prophetic powers that we briefly discussed this morning in our lesson, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2. But after the completion of God's word, uh, they were 
replaced by teachers who receive their messages now from the written word of God, the complete divine revelation of God that we have here with us. All I can say is thank God for teachers and preachers who heed Paul's advice to Timothy when he says, preach the word in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience and diligence. That word, in season and out of season, on which we must preach the word, for the longest time as a kid hearing that, I always thought that it meant, oh, okay, so when it's winter time, when it's summertime, when it's springtime, when it's fall, okay, so that's when, you know, we have to keep preaching the word. So basically just all year round. Well, I wasn't close to that. <laughs> I wasn't close at all. In season simply means that when the times are good, when the times of harvest are great, when the church is doing great, when the church is on fire, keep preaching the word. But we also need to keep preaching the word even at times when it's out of season, when things are not so good, when the lives of the brothers and sisters in the church are dealing with a lot of difficulties, a lot of trials, sufferings, and tribulations, still preach the word. Even when the preacher himself may be suffering from a lot of persecution, maybe from a lot of ridicule, from a lot of slander, when a lot's going on in his personal life, preach the word. Thank God for preachers and teachers who take heed of Paul's advice, preaching the word in the good times and the bad times, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with patience and diligence. Thank God for those true prophets, for those true teachers and preachers of the word, for those healthy, good trees. Thank God for them. But then there's also false prophets. This is the bad direction giver. False prophets, they claim to speak for God, but do so falsely. The Greek word that's used here for false is where we get our English word for pseudo, which means fake, forgery, pretend, lie, and deceive. Jesus said that we need to be aware of lying teachers who would deceive us, and we should be aware of that at all times, at all costs. Now, there's no sense in putting up a beware of the dogs outside of your house when all you have is just a friendly, loving, cuddly cat. The fact that Jesus said beware of false prophets indicates that they existed in his day and that they will always exist in this day and all the days to come. Now, of course, when Jesus made the statement, I'm sure that he was looking directly at the scribes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. False teachers certainly did not begin or end with those groups. When Jesus later spoke about what would happen before the destruction of Jerusalem, he said that false prophets will arise and mislead many. Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, verse 11, and verse 24. Paul wrote of false teachers who would come with a different gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Paul even named two false teachers in 2 Timothy and said that they had gone astray from the truth and has led many away from the faith. 2 Timothy 2, verse 17 and 18. Peter told Christians that false prophets arose among the Jewish people, and they will likewise rise among us today. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Now many false teachers are, in fact, self-deceived. When you later on read verse 21 through 23, you can see that many of them are self-deceived. But some are not. Why would anyone deliberately become a false teacher? Well, I'm not a mind reader, and so I can't give you just the exact perfect answer to that question. I'm not the judger of motives, but what we can do is that we can logically come up with some possible suggestions as to why many today just become deliberate false teachers. One reason may be because of pay. Because of money. 
Some teachers and preachers are, to use a term from the King James Version, hirelings. They are hirelings. John chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. These hirelings are individuals who just do a job for pay. That's it. Paul refers to those types of hirelings as being peddlers. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. Now this word for peddler that's used there in that passage was used for the wine merchants who tricked consumers by diluting and mixing the wine with old wine. Very old wine. Jesus used that same imagery about the mixing of the new wine and the old wine when he condemned the Pharisees for mixing and diluting God's word with their man-made traditions. Later on, he says that and condemns them for that in Matthew chapter 9, verse 17. But now a hireling is a peddler who diluted, falsified their message, and sold it for money. They go out and they find ignorant listeners with itching ears and tell them what they want to hear. They teach the popular and favored views of society that draws in the most money. So one logical explanation why many may become a, a deliberate false teacher is for money, is for pay. A second logical reasoning that may be the reason why some become deliberate false teachers is because of prestige. Prestige. In the early church, apparently some always wanted to be known as teachers because of the honor and the prestige they thought that this would bring. But however, little did they know, according to James chapter 3, verse 1, that many should not become teachers of the word. For in being a teacher of the word, we will be held with stricter judgment. Stricter judgment in the sense that we will be held doubly accountable. We'll be judged twice. So for an example, me, as being a full-time minister and preacher of God's word, when judgment day comes, God's going to judge me on two accounts. One, if I lived the Christian life faithfully according to his word. And two, if I taught accurately his word of truth. Some should not take the mantle of being a teacher or preacher of the word, especially when their motives are impure. If you're doing it for prestige, if you're doing it for fame, for honor, for, uh, for praise, for glory of self, just like the Pharisees were doing, first off, that praise, that prestige, it's not going to last forever. It's only temporary. And secondly, you're going to be held doubly accountable on Judgment Day. A third and logical suggestion as to why many may become deliberate false teachers is because of power. There are some, like Diotrephus, who love to be first among the congregation members. That's 3 John, verse 9. They desire to impose this, uh, their will on others. Sounds a little bit familiar from what we've been studying from 2 Peter chapter 2, does it not? <laughs> very similar, very familiar. Whether self-deceived or deliberate, whatever the motivation, our text tells us, Two things about the false prophets. First off, they are dangerous. They are dangerous. Jesus called them wolves. Wolves, ravenous wolves, who are in sheep's clothing. The church is the flock of God, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And wolves are the natural enemies of sheep, John chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. Sheep are powerless against bloodthirsty predators. And so Paul warned the elders at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. Notice that. He warned the elders. Whose responsibility is it to protect the flock and make sure that wolves don't come in and try to eat them? It's the elders, men of the church, the leaders. It's their responsibility. He warned the elders at Ephesus, saying that after my departure, ravenous wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Acts 20, 29. The Greek word for ravenous means the point of madness. It is the point of madness. Wolves, hungry, hungry wolves, who are at the point of madness. 
So I want you to just visualize in your mind right here, I know this right here uh, kind of helps with it a little bit, but I want you to imagine in your mind just a pack of growling wolves who are showing their fangs to you, saliva drooling out of their mouth, and their eyes are just pierced right at you, and they are hungry. All they want to do is eat you up and take advantage of you. But not only are these false teachers dangerous, they are deceptive. They disguise themselves in sheep's clothing. Jesus was most likely using a proverbial expression, meaning that ravenous wolves do not always look like ravenous wolves. Often they look like sheep, harmless and non-threatening. They come across very charming. But Paul said that false teachers are able to disguise themselves as being angels of light. They're able to disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. They're able to disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 and 14. False teachers do not announce their coming with the words, Oh, here comes the false teacher. They don't come wearing a big sign around their head or a big uh, plaque across their chest that says, False teacher is on his way. They don't come announcing themselves. They come very discreetly, secretly, quietly, cunningly. They wear the right clothes. They may even use the right religious words. And sometimes that can be a little bit scary because that can make them even more dangerous. When Jude wrote of certain false teachers, he said that they crept in unnoticed. Jude verse 4. Now, crept in unnoticed is one word in the Greek. And it simply means to enter in by the side. Enter in by the side. One person has put it this way. False teachers, when they enter in, they take the side doors. They enter in by the side doors where no one's watching, no one's looking. But now, if false teachers are so deceptive and so dangerous, how can we possibly identify them? Well, this is where we get into the second point here. He says there are two kinds of fruits. You will know them by their fruits, he says. The Greek word that's used here for know refers to the experiential knowledge. You'll experience it. But even more, Jesus uses this word as an emphatic word. He puts emphasis on this Greek word. Meaning that you will really, really know and experience in other words, the way we can really identify false teachers is to look at their fruits. And so he says that there's two kinds of fruits, two kinds of trees. There's healthy tree and a diseased tree. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. The healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, and the diseased tree cannot bear good fruit. Now, the word that's used for healthy in the Greek is the same word for sound in 2 Timothy 4, 3, where Paul says that for the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. That's what sound means. It means healthy, healthy doctrine. It's the same word that's used here for the tree. And so this healthy tree, again, is an analogy that represents the good preacher, the true preacher. And so a sound preacher the healthy tree is the sound preacher. The healthy tree is one that produces edible fruit, while the diseased tree is one that produces rotten and spoiled fruit. So Jesus indicates that by their fruits you will really know who a sound teacher and a false teacher is. In fact, Jesus referred to how people use the fruit test in nature. Look at verse 16. He says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now, can you imagine people going out to a briar patch to pick grapes 
or taking their basket to a clump of thistles expecting to find figs? How can we apply the fruit test to those who teach us? Well, to do so, we need to understand that there are various kinds of fruit and that a variety of fruit tests are needed. So, what kind of fruit tests are needed? Well, there's three that I have in mind. When it comes to being fruit inspectors, number one, there is the doctrine test. There is the doctrine test. In other words, what one teaches. John wrote about some who were trying to deceive his readers. And so he writes saying, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Well, test them. Test them how? By comparing what they teach with God's inspired truth. That is why the Bereans were so noble in Acts 17, verse 11. Because whatever Paul spoke to them, they didn't just take his word for it. They tested it. And they searched the scriptures to see if these things that he was teaching were so, were true, and were accurate. And folks, I encourage you to make that same application in regards to me, in regards to Hunter, in regards to Sid, and whoever, whichever brother is up here preaching and teaching. He said, don't just take their word for it. Look at the scriptures. Look at the context for yourself. Study it for yourself. And find the answer and the conclusion for yourself. Don't just take anybody's word for it, but test it. Search the scriptures. Compare it. Compare what they teach with God's inspired truth. Because today the world is flooded with so much false doctrine. And it seems that almost every single day there's a new false teaching <laughs> that's arising. <laughs> I'm occasionally asked this question. How can we possibly deal with all these false teachings in the world? There's so many, and there are. <laughs> How can we possibly deal with all of these false teachings? Well, my answer is this. By constantly reading, studying, and thinking, and meditating, and applying God's Word. That's the simple, most basic solution. Reading, studying, thinking, meditating, and applying God's Word. If the truth of God's Word is ingrained into your very being, you will be able to identify error when you hear it. I have a friend of mine who uh, was studying uh, forgery, and what they had him do, and to be able to figure out if a $100 bill is counterfeit or not, they had him study an authentic $100 bill forwards and backwards. And he was expecting to study the counterfeit ones to figure out what's counterfeit. But his instructor said, if you're able to just easily know what an authentic, genuine $100 bill is, then you'd easily be able to spot a counterfeit one. If all you do is just study and examine forwards and backwards, an authentic $100 bill, then you'll be able to spot a forgery or spot a counterfeit one. Folks, the same principle applies with God's Word. If you're able to study it forwards and backwards, you're not going to know everything, don't get me wrong, you're not going to know everything. But if you're able to study it, keep on reading it, studying it, and applying it, and meditating it, then you'll easily be able to spot out error when it comes your way. No test is more important than the doctrine test. If a person is not teaching the word truthfully and accurately, he is a false teacher. But now we cannot, however, always identify a false teacher by his teaching. Because the devil himself can even quote scripture, can he not? Think back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. Sometimes the problem is not so much what a false teacher teaches as what he fails to teach. If he fails to teach the plan of salvation, folks, that should raise a red flag. If he fails to teach about the one true church, that should also raise another flag. If he fails to teach the five acts of worship, when we come together to worship as the public worship assembly, another red flag should raise in your head. 
And folks, the list goes on. And so sometimes it's not so much as to what he teaches as to what he fails to teach. A second test as being fruit inspectors would be the conduct test. We need to examine the fruit of a teacher's life. We should ask whether or not the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, is evident in what he does. We need to examine carefully how a teacher lives and what he does. However, a teacher cannot always be recognized by his life. Some false teachers live good, moral lives. So, how then can we identify such? Well, that quickly brings us to that third test, which is what I like to call the result test. What kind of fruit does this teaching produce? This is not referring to if he has produced enough conversions, amount, a number amount of baptisms, because false teachers tend to actually convert more followers than those who are true teachers. <laughs> because false teachers, what are they doing? They're teaching what people want to hear. And the majority of people of what they want to hear will go with them down the wide and broad path, the path that leads to destruction. So... The results the, uh, of what um, his life produces, or what his teaching produces, is not necessarily talking about how many number of baptisms he's had or how many people he's, con he's converted. Rather, Jesus is talking about whether or not it results and produces righteousness. What God wants is the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. James wrote that the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James 3, 18. Now, sadly, not all seed, teaching, that is, produces righteousness. Nor is it sown in peace. Several negative results of the wrong kind of teaching are found in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Ungodliness being promoted. In verse 16... Paul says that worldly chatter can lead to further ungodliness. In verse 17 and 18, he says that false doctrine can spread like gangrene and upset the faith of many. And he says in verse 23, foolish and ignorant speculations produce quarrels, arguments. In other words, does this teaching produce a whole bunch of people arguing and bickering back and forth with each other? Is his teaching all just about worldly chatter? I can think of an example of like one who gets up here and all he talks about is politics and politics and politics and politics. <laughs> well, is that being sown in peace? Is that being produced in righteousness? No. Seems that if all they ever talk about is just political stuff, political stuff, political stuff, and start bashing all the political candidates and everything nonstop, then that's just going to cause more issues, more issues within the church. If he's a man who is teaching more about his opinions than the Word of God, trying to force his opinion and his will on the listeners, well, is that being sown in peace and in righteousness? No. We need to ask questions like the following. As a result of the teaching of this individual, are people growing closer to God? Are they being convicted by the teaching? Is it piercing their heart and their soul to the point to that, that they know that they need to make a change in their life and apply the lessons into their life? Are they more faithful to the Word of God? Do they show more love for one another? We ask those types of questions, and whatever answers may arise, then you'll be able to figure out whether this is a true preacher or this is a false teacher. As we consider the fruit test, I want us to remember that just as it takes time for fruit to grow gradually, we must not be quick to just pull the trigger right away. Patience is needed, therefore, when we apply this test. So, what difference does it make 
Why is this so important? Well, in Jesus' time, think of it like this. Trees were usually not grown for decoration. <laughs> they might be grown for fuel or to provide wood for building things, but mainly, trees were planted and grown for fruit. That was one of the main purposes, is just for fruit. If a fruit tree did not produce edible fruit, it was draining the soil of nutrients needed by the good trees. So the unproductive tree was therefore cut down and used for fuel, thrown in the fire and used for fuel. Jesus uses that illustration here, spiritually speaking. When he says right there in verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I believe that he wasn't quite necessarily talking about the fire that gives fuel. <laughs> I believe he was talking about the, the fire of eternal damnation. Jesus made it clear that false teachers will be punished in the fires of hell. When Peter wrote of the coming of the false teachers, he said that such will bring swift destruction upon who? Themselves. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But now, a lot of people ask this question, what about those who are following the teachers? Those who are following the false teachers, are they held accountable? Well, they are on the same road, are they not? If they're on the same road as the false teacher, then they're going to be headed to the same destination. Jesus later on says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 14, he says that when the blind is following and being guided by the blind, they're both going to fall into the pit. We might adapt his saying like this, if a false prophet guides the gullible, both are headed for eternal destruction. That is why it makes a difference, an eternal difference for us to listen to the right spiritual guides. As we bring this section to a close, let me again ask, which way are you traveling? There are two roads, a broad way that leads to destruction and a narrow way that leads to life. Which road are you traveling? I'd like to also follow up with the second question. Whose directions are you following? There are two kinds of guides. There's a false one and a true one. Which kind of guide are you following? There is no doubt about which road Jesus wants us on or what kind of spiritual guide he wants us to hear and follow. It has been noted that when he used the words, enter through, that is not just a command or an exhortation, but also an invitation. In our text, Jesus does not merely warn us. He also invites us. He welcomes us. And he is still urging all who will listen, enter through the narrow gate. Which road are you traveling? Whose directions are you following? Folks, we can help you in any way. Please come forward together as we stand and sing. <clears throat> Just as I am.